Hong Kong police raid pro-democracy newspaper Apple Daily's headquarters. Five top executives were seized under the city's national security law. It marks the second raid in less than a year. The new law has also seeped into the city's movie sector. We interviewed a longtime Hollywood producer to get his take. The U.S. seeks to ease tensions with Russia. This comes as President Biden and Russian President Putin meet face to face on Wednesday. But China doesn't seem pleased about the talks. And a young man in Beijing attempted to report a YouTuber for supporting Taiwan independence. But his visit to the police didn't go exactly as planned. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. A local Hong Kong newspaper saw an unexpected holdup this morning when 500 police officers raided its headquarters. It's the second police raid of a company property in just one year's time. Here are the details. Hong Kong police dispatched over 500 officers on Thursday to raid Apple Daily headquarters. They arrested five of the newspaper's directors under the city's national security law passed by Beijing last year. Authorities accused them of what they called collusion with a foreign country or external elements to endanger national security. The charge carries a maximum penalty of life in prison. The paper's founder, Jimmy Lai, is already serving a prison sentence for his role in the city's pro-democracy protest in 2019. It's the second time the media outlet's headquarters were raided in less than a year. In August 2020, just a month after the national security law went into effect, 200 Hong Kong police stormed the newsroom for the first time. Stephen Butler serves as Asia coordinator of the Committee to Protect Journalists. He explained in a statement, The arrests of five executives at the pro-democracy Apple Daily today under Hong Kong's Orwellian national security law destroy any remaining fiction that Hong Kong supports freedom of the press. The latest raid began early in the morning in the name of a search operation. In a separate press release, officials revealed that the executives' homes were also searched. A national security official later confirmed that Hong Kong authorities had frozen about $2.5 million in assets from three companies tied to Apple Daily. The official also touched on a series of 30 Apple Daily articles from 2019, encouraging global sanctions on China, saying they were linked to the current collusion charge. The city's national security law took effect on June 30, 2020. It's not retrospective, meaning the law doesn't apply to anything done before that time. So it's unclear why officials now consider the article's evidence. The raid on Apple Daily is causing a stir in the international community. The British Foreign Secretary commented that the raid shows Beijing is using the national security law to target dissenting voices, not tackle public security. A European Union spokesperson said in a statement that the raid further demonstrates how the national security law is being used to stifle media freedom and freedom of expression in Hong Kong. Taiwan's foreign minister posted his frustration on Twitter, saying authoritarianism is waging a brutal war on Apple Daily Hong Kong, a desperately endangered symbol of freedom in Hong Kong. He added, I am out of words to describe my anger and sadness at witnessing this tragedy. Hong Kong's film censors now have the power to ban movies that they deem a threat to national security. That's after authorities updated their film censorship guidelines. NTD interviewed a longtime Hollywood producer to get his insights on the matter. NTD's Don Ma has more. Hong Kong's national security law has officially seeped into its entertainment sector. The city's recently updated guidelines for film censors say if a movie amounts to an offense endangering national security, then the censor should prohibit it from being shown. Longtime Hollywood movie producer and former president of DMG Entertainment, Chris Fenton, tells NTD he's not surprised that the law has taken hold of the entertainment space. But he says Hollywood won't go out of its way to cater to the national security law solely to gain access to the Hong Kong market. That's because it's not significant enough. But here's what he says Hollywood will do instead. The national security law, as it applies to Hong Kong, is also one that can apply, obviously, to China, too, mainland China. So if Hollywood is placating the Chinese Communist Party with a particular movie for the mainland China market, that's also going to work for the Hong Kong market. A lot of industries, Hollywood included, are now looking at the territory as if it's just part of the PRC itself and as if 
And it's very possible that Hollywood will continue to placate to the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP. Fenton says despite U.S. politicians showing a firmer stance on China, Hollywood doesn't appear to be following suit. Obviously, we're seeing Washington, D.C. on a bipartisan basis, both Democrats and, and Republicans start to come together on trying to push back Chinese Communist uh, Party encroachment on American rights and American laws. But we're not seeing it from Hollywood just yet. In fact, um, in the Fenton has worked on blockbuster movies like Iron Man 3 and Looper. He also wrote a book that takes a close look at Hollywood and China titled Feeding the Dragon. Yeah, well, one of the things that my book does is talk about promotion of China almost as if it's a commercial, right? The way we looked at getting the Chinese government on board with supporting a movie and allowing us access to the market was how do we make China and the Chinese government look as good as possible? To get Hollywood's placating to Beijing will ultimately affect what audiences get to see on screen. Fenton gives us an example of this from his personal experience. So um, in the book, I talk quite a bit about two particular movies that we did it with. One was Looper, a Bruce Willis, Joseph Gordon-Levitt movie, where we actually changed the future of where that movie took place 40 years in the future from today to China. It used to be in the script before we got a hold of it, France. And Bruce Willis, instead of marrying a French woman in the movie, he married a Chinese woman who he met in China. Um, played by the producer reveals an eye-opening detail on what Beijing's endgame is for Hollywood. The CCP wants to use movies to promote communism as the best form of government. So if you look at what they would particularly like in movies that come in from the outside, are movies that promote that idea that the Chinese Communist Party run by Xi Jinping is a fantastic form of government. They want the message that China has the best form of government globally. And that is what their ultimate goal is with these particular films that come from Hollywood. And that's the pressure. That but Fenton also points out something encouraging. That is, consumers, various media and politicians are taking notice of what Hollywood is doing. And they're putting more pressure on the film industry to stop it from catering to Beijing. Don Ma, NTD News. The U.S. is seeking to ease tensions with Russia at the Biden-Putin summit. This comes as the two countries both deal with something in common, China. At a low point in U.S.-Russia relations, U.S. President Biden and Russian President Putin met face-to-face -face on Wednesday. Well, we should be able to cooperate where it's in our mutual interest. China was one of the topics they talked about. In the past, Biden used to highlight his close relationship with Chinese Communist Party leader Xi Jinping. In 2013, Xi even called Biden his old friend, but not this time. Let's get something straight. We know each other well. We're not old friends. It's just pure business. Last month, Biden ordered aides to find the origins of the CCP virus. Biden said the U.S. is looking at different theories, including the Wuhan lab leak theory. But he appeared concerned. Is China really actually trying to get to the bottom of this? The Biden administration now seems to hold the view that China is a rising power and one that seeks to change the global order by force. An earlier U.S. national security report placed China at the top of its strategic challengers calling China the only competitor to mount a sustained challenge. Despite all the frictions between the U.S. and Russia, Biden delivered a key point during the summit, that the U.S. is still willing to cooperate with Russia. I did what I came to do. Number one, identify areas of practical work our two countries can do to advance our mutual interest and also benefit the world. Russia's cozy relationship with China masks deep disputes, as of 2020, China is Russia's largest trading partner. Russia, meanwhile, doesn't even make it to China's top 10. A reporter asked Biden why Russia would want to cooperate with the U.S. He answered, Russia is in a very, very difficult spot right now. They are being squeezed by China. The Biden-Putin summit lasted less than three hours, shorter than expected. Both presidents described the meeting positively. In a joint statement, they said the meeting showed progress on shared goals even amid tension. The U.S. and Russia have also agreed to reinstate their ambassadors. Both U.S. President Biden and Russian President Putin agree that their meeting on Wednesday was good, positive and quite constructive. President Putin and I had a uh, share a unique responsibility to manage the relationship between two powerful and proud countries. 
relationship that uh, has to be stable and predictable. But Communist China seems unhappy about it. Biden noted during the meeting that Russia is in a very difficult situation. He said they are being squeezed by China. They want desperately to remain a major power. A Chinese state-owned media immediately reported on Biden's words, with a headline titled, Biden is provoking discord. They allege that Biden is trying to pit Russia and China against each other. And the report also says that Biden's so-called little trick will never succeed. The Chinese media rejects the idea that Russia is being squeezed by China and instead claims that Russia is being squeezed by the United States and that China's rise gave Russia support against the West. Coming up, a young man in Beijing attempted to report a Taiwanese YouTuber for supporting Taiwan independence, but his visit to the police station didn't go exactly as planned. More on that after the break. Don't let YouTube decide what information you get. That's your choice. YouTube is deleting our videos and cuts you off from a source of honest reporting. Make sure you don't lose access to NTD's news content and take a quick moment to subscribe to our newsletter so no matter what happens here, you'll keep your access to a trustworthy news source. A young man in Beijing plans something big. He asked Chinese authorities to arrest a Taiwanese YouTuber for supporting Taiwan independence. But in the end, the young man got slapped with a fine from Chinese police for watching YouTube illegally. One Beijing resident is being fined by the Chinese state after reaching out to local police. The interaction didn't go as he had planned. The young man is one of China's so-called little pinks. The term refers to Chinese netizens who support the Chinese Communist Party online often lashing out against anyone who criticizes Beijing or the party. By going to the police, he had aimed to report a Taiwanese YouTuber for posting content promoting Taiwan independence. But as it turned out, the police instead fined him $500. That's for using an illegal proxy to break through the country's internet firewall. Many social platforms like Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube are not accessible in China. Visiting them is considered illegal. The young man who filmed the incident burst into tears over the penalty. The video was also posted online. Some comments remarked that he would now taste the iron fists of the mainland, while others expressed concern for him, saying they worry about his safety because he secretly recorded and uploaded it online. He first recorded himself on the way to the police station, holding printouts of the YouTuber's profile and other content. He began the clip by introducing himself as China-loving youth Liu Si Tong and explained he had big plans, that is to report Taiwan YouTuber Shi Tu Riji. He seemed to expect a positive result, saying, he called his action a very meaningful thing to do. He was ordered to stop recording at the police reception desk. Huh? Uh, he met with a police officer but continued to record audio of the encounter. While trying to express his anger at the YouTube personality, the police shifted focus to how exactly he watched the YouTube video in the first place. After some further lecturing from the police, he wrote out a confession statement and was given a ticket. China's market regulator is starting an investigation into Chinese ride-hailing giant Didi. This right before the firm is about to go public on the U.S. stock market. Three people with knowledge of the matter told Reuters about it on Wednesday. Didi's initial public offering or IPO on the U.S. stock market is expected to be the biggest debut of the year, with nearly $100 billion. That would make it the biggest Chinese offering in the U.S. since Alibaba went public in 2014. The antitrust probe is the latest in a sweeping crackdown on China's so-called platform companies. They include Jack Ma's Alibaba and popular Chinese messaging app WeChat's parent company Tencent.
The sources said China's market regulator is investigating whether DD used any competitive practices to squeeze out smaller rivals unfairly. The regulator is also examining whether DD's pricing system for ride hailing is transparent enough. DD refused to comment, and the Chinese regulator did not respond to requests for comment. On the sunny Pacific shore of California, a privately owned radio station broadcasts a weekly show warning of the dangers of communism. The show particularly singles out the Chinese Communist Party. We hear more from NTD's David Lamb. People come to Santa Cruz to enjoy the ocean and sunshine. However, several Americans living here are working hard to deliver their message about the other side of the ocean. He just made one offhand comment about Xi Jinping, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden, he's in the process of losing everything. It's a place full of lies. You know, you could say that same statement about every country in the world if you want. KSCO is locally owned and operated. The president took ownership of the station in 1991. The station's broadband reaches a third of California's real estate and is accessible online. And the station has over 30 programs. They started a new program in September called China Uber Alice. The purpose of our program is to let people know that communism and Chinese communism in particular is not a friend to the United States. The hosts talk about U.S. and China relations as well as human rights abuses of Chinese citizens. And I have no bones saying that. And I think a lot of other people are afraid to say that. Okay. I'm not afraid to say it. I think the CCP is evil. Evil. Brainwash. I understand why, why the you know, Chinese government I'm, reacted the way I'm it did. I'm talking about it. it's, very, it's a long term. Even I left China. The China Uber Alice program usually starts with an anecdote from Amy Howe, who spent 10 years imprisoned in a CCP labor camp. She says if they don't talk about what China was like before the Cultural Revolution, nobody will know the damage the CCP has inflicted. The next generation, next generation, they don't even know about. So I think that I wanted to talk about those stories. I just don't want to bury it forever, you know. Howe said they received phone calls from listeners as far as Australia and New Zealand. Even you get a free country, sometimes I get nightmare, I wake up, I say, so glad I look everywhere, oh, this is America, you know. 1949. That's, That's correct. Right. That's and right. that mind control has been in effect since 1949. The show title, China Uber Alice, is a reference to a Nazi slogan. The Nazi anthem, which was Deutschland Uber Alles, which meant Germany overall. Um, Uh, The idea that the Chinese Communist Party would like to see itself as being the dominant power in the world, uh, it would be China overall, essentially. China has more naval ships than the United States Navy now, right? So that's a threat. The station's audience have spoken positively to the hosts for the show. They've been saying that they like the idea that we're focusing on uh, what China is is up to around the world. Listeners can tune in live every Thursday afternoon, 2 to 4 Pacific time, or anytime on their website. Reporting in Santa Cruz, David Lamb, NTD News. One investigation reveals that two universities in Southern California gave special perks to high school students in China. Commentators say it's driven by money. Here's NTD's Eileen Eng with more. An investigation carried out by Insider claims that University of California, Irvine, and Riverside had given special treatment to students at a private high school in China. UC Irvine reportedly offered specially arranged summer school programs for students at Pegasus California School, a private academy in Qingdao, China. The college sent admission staffers to its campus to talk to students and their parents. UC Riverside allegedly promised to help the students become competitive applicants and allowed them to submit applications even after the deadline had passed. The schools worked with a businessman named Stephen Ma who helped students get the upper hand in the admissions process. One former graduate from UC Riverside said he did not hear or know of anyone who received any special treatment, but he did say it's very normal because it is like doing business. They always need money to hire uh, you know, famous professors, getting more reimbursement for the labs and all kind of things. So it's kind of normal to me that 
you know, they give an easy standard for those international students because, you know, they need money. A China expert and senior reporter for the Epic Times says it's not which students they admit. It's about the money and maintaining the relationship with the Chinese government. So U- University of California has made China become one of its financial lifelines. So it is a general public concern that the cutting-edge technologies that's still on the research stage in the UC labs does not have enough security and safety measures. Su said this collaboration would make for a hard-to-refuse request since the UCs would be funded by either the Chinese government or the students' private families. In an emailed response, UC Irvine stated, Any arrangements or interactions UCI has had with the Pegasus California School are no different than those available to other high schools. We have never had any special arrangements with them. UC Riverside responded, It's difficult to control the promises and misrepresentations made by third parties in admissions matters. No admissions promises were made by UCR to Pegasus California School. Eileen Ang, NTD News, California. And that's all for today's China on Focus. But before you go, we have a special report coming this Friday, focused on the recent tensions surrounding Taiwan. The Chinese regime is provoking global conflict over Taiwan. Taiwan is clearly um, one of their ambitions before that. And I think the threat is manifest during this decade, in fact, in the next six years. And one question may decide the fate of China's relations with the West. Would the United States go to war with China to defend Taiwan? But there's no easy answer. In a special report, we look into why an Asian island about the size of Maryland is becoming the flashpoint of the U.S.-China clash, why the Chinese regime sees ruling Taiwan as an issue of life or death, and why that danger to Taiwan could threaten the safety of the American people and the current world order. For the U.S. military, the CCP's military threat to Taiwan is part and parcel of their military threat to the United States. So the U.S. military must respond to them as one. To find out, check out our latest special report on Epoch TV. China in Focus is partnering with the platform, and that's where you can watch our exclusive content every Friday night. In them, we'll explore questions like how China lures in foreign companies to steal their technology, how the Chinese regime is actively collecting health data on people around the world, how the ancient Chinese philosophy of good governance differs from the current-day communist regime, and much more. Be sure to check out these investigative episodes by clicking on the link in the description down below. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you really want to understand what's happening with China. You can still watch our Monday to Thursday episodes for free on YouTube, NTD Cable TV, the NTD website and the Epoch TV website. Thanks for watching and see you next time.